Now, by the time you get to chapter number 2 in Hosea, lots already happened in chapter number 1. Hosea hears from the Lord. He says, go out and take your wife of one of the people that aren't a God. It's very unusual. Very unusual. Sure. All the way back, starting with Abraham. God said, go back to your own people. Take one that knows about me. But here, God had a reason for it. First child that was born unto Hosea, his name was Jezreel. God said, reason. God told him to call the child Jezreel. It's because he would avenge the death of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Now, that, that's a whole another four Sundays right there, going back and studying all that out. Okay, but the second child that was born was a daughter. Her name was Loru Hathma. That means I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. It means no mercy or the withholding of mercy. Then, third child that he had, God said, you know what, you need to call that guy. You get down to verse number 9, Lo Ami, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. Okay, these three literal children that Hosea had, that God said, name them this, as a testament of what I say unto the nation of Israel. And then, verse number 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand on the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Amen. Now that's prophecy. Yes. That's dealing with two things. One, where did Jesus go? He went back to the land of Israel. Sure. He, he walked, talked, preached, sure. lived in what nowadays people call the Holy Land. But what was, it was the promised land. It was part of what God had promised unto Abraham. But also it's talking about that millennial reign. Sure. It's talking about the battle of Armageddon where those that have rejected the sign of the Antichrist, the ones that have you know, endured hardness, they've lived in caves, they've had to scrounge for food, they've had to steal for food, not because they were afraid, but because they would rather serve God sure. than give in to the Antichrist. When they get called back to the place where once they were called the children of God, now they're called the sons of God. Right? Jesus is going to lay on the Mount of Olives, put that sucker in two. Amen. Right? He's going to come in, he's going to sit down on the throne, and they aren't going to be the subjects of God. No, those 144,000 Jews, they're going to be the sons of God. Yeah. They'll live as long as anybody else during the millennial reign. Right? There are those that, in the you know, book of Revelation, it talks about those that endured hardness. Sure. They were slaughtered. Those that made it through the end of the tribulation and those that died the way of the martyr during the tribulation, they're going to come out. They're going to be called the sons of God. That's right. right? whole lot going on there. Don't have time to get to all that. But that's what happens in chapter number one. Chapter number two rolls around. Verse number one, he says, Say unto your brethren... Ami. Well, who's that? Well, that's the third child that we talked about. Loami. Okay, or Loami. And to your sisters, Ruhama. That's his daughter that we already talked about. He says, say unto your brethren and your sisters, but also, verse number two, plead with your mother. Plead. Not once, plead twice. Plead all you can plead with your mother. What's he saying? Go to the other children of Israel and tell them what God has told your dad. Their prophet, their father was Hosea the prophet. He says, take your namesake and go and tell everybody else. Give them the warning. Well, what's the warning? He says, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. They say, because Israel has rejected me, go and plead with them because Israel's no longer the wife of God. God's no longer the husband of Israel. 
Not because God desired it to be so, but because Israel desired it to be so. It says, neither am I her husband, for let her therefore put away her whoredoms. God said, I'm not going to solve it for her. She's got to choose to put it away. She chose to go out and abandon God and commit adultery with all these false gods. I mean, it says, let her therefore put away her whoredoms from out of her side and her adulteries from between her breasts. What do you hang on a necklace? Something that's either very valuable or very precious to you. Because you don't want it going nowhere. You want it close. It's where that old adage that, you know, women will clutch their pearls. Because they're valuable, they keep them right here, close to them, but to where it can still be seen. What's that saying? God's saying, you've taken that place near your heart, and you've given it to something else other than God. That's why he's saying, let her put it away. You chose to put it on, so put it away. Just as you chose God, now you must choose to return to God. But then... Verse number four, and I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredom. He's saying a whole generation or more has gone by without knowing what God is. And I will not be their father. Because, for lack of a better term, if any man's not a son, he's a bastard. Right? You weren't raised in the way of the Lord, so what does God have to be your father for? Right? What, what is God obligated to do if those that just live however they want to, like heathens, why is God required to go after them? Right? That's what he's saying. He's saying, you knew better and you raised them wrong. Sure. They say, why is that my problem? But then, verse number five, for the mother hath played the harlot. She hath conceived them, hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. In other words, those things that she lifts off, water, well, doctors will tell you you can go about three days without water. You need water. Not just any water, clean water. Salt water will kill you quicker than dehydration will. That ain't going to start messing with your head, you'll start seeing stuff. Right? It'll eat you up from the inside out. Need clean water. Then it goes on to say, my wool. What's that? My warmth. My clothing. Because back in the day, they abided, you know, if they cared about what God said, they would abide by the law. They wouldn't wear blended fabrics. Wasn't no 90% wool, 10% cotton. It was all one thing. And if I had a cotton shirt on, I couldn't have on wool pants. It had to all be of one fabric. So when it says wool, that means it's my warmth. That's my clothing. But then also my flax, mine oil. What are those? That's when, when clothing's not enough, it's the warmth of the fire. But also that oil is made to cook with. Right? Without oil, you didn't make much food back in the day. Everything that they did, they pretty much baked it or cooked it or an ingredient in it was oil That's right. they tell me I have no idea but if you try to make a cake without oil or without an egg something that holds it together it falls apart in the oven sure. right you pull it out and most of it's either burnt or it's all falling apart right well oil spiritually is a picture of yep. the spirit right. without the spirit you're falling apart but right. yeah. instead of looking to God they're looking toward their lovers, their adulteries to provide these things for them. It says, ain't my drink, what's that? My sustenance, the things above and beyond, not just food and water, but those things that make me merry, are the things that I delight in. Verse number six, God says, therefore behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make up a wall, and she shall not find her paths. She will follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. And shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then was it better with me than now. 
For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. God saying, I was good to you even when you didn't realize that the things I was giving you, you were turning around and giving it to a false god. Talk about long suffering. Talk about merciful. God saying, not only did I give you what you needed, I gave you not just some, it said he multiplied silver and gold. Nowadays, they'd, took, they'd call that exponential growth. Right? That wasn't one plus one, that was about two times two. And then four times four. And then 16 times 16. But she left it. Notice God in verse number six, he says, Therefore, I will make a hedge around them, not of protection, of thorns. Why? To show them that the way you're going is painful. You know what he's talking about? I mean, through prophecy, what he's talking about is all the bondage, all the captivity, everything that Israel will have to endure before they can get back to where they call themselves the sons of God, and God will call them the sons of God. I mean, in prophecy, think about the way of you know, a hedge of thorns. Then he goes on to say, I will make up a wall, she will not find her pass. Can you imagine Hosea having this told to him and then something like the Holocaust happening? He didn't realize that that's what, but God has done many things to the nation of Israel or allowed them to happen to Israel to try and get them to realize the Messiah has already come as the Lamb, but one day he'll come back as Lord. And all of it comes down to it. They won't let go of what they've brought into their own lives. But see, that's literally what this chapter is talking about. But spiritually, I see some things that we can glean from. Verse number 9, he goes on to say, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax, given to clove, or cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. Because who was the Lord? The first husband. Sure. The one that she forsook. Sure. Right? The one that she promised to be faithful to, but she wasn't. This says, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. Right? Well, you can give somebody a tree, and God's the one that gives the increase. That's right. Right. Did not Jesus look at a fig tree that bore not fruit and cursed it that it wouldn't ever bear fruit? He said, you're not doing the one thing that I told you to do, produce fruit. Yep. So because you didn't do, I'll curse you to not have it. That's what he's saying here. You can get all the trees you want, they're not going to bear fruit. Oh, he's saying you're planting, you're sowing the wrong kind of trees. He says, I will cause her... I will also cause all her mirth in verse number 11 to cease. Her feast days, the new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Anyway, I'm going to take away her joy, her happiness. Sure. Okay, then verse number 13. I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. She's saying she not only forsook God, she put on her best to serve a false god. She decked herself out with everything that she had that she thought was valuable to look her best for a feast of Balaam. It's one thing to forsake somebody, it's another thing to spit in their face while you're doing it. Right then, verse number 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. He's saying, if she'll put away those things that she brought into her own life, I'll take her to a private place and I'll speak comfortably to her. Not to rebuke her, because if she put it away, she already realized the error of her ways. He says, I'm not going to preach to her, but we're going to go and we're going to settle some things in the wilderness. He yeah. says, and I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt and it shall be at that day saith the Lord that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt call me no more Bali yeah. 
And you know what Ishi means? Yep. Husband. He already beat me to the punch. You know what Bali is? It's a plural of Balaam, but it means Lord. It's one thing to see God as your overlord. It's another thing to see him as your husband. Instead of the one that commands you to do, that's the one that provides. Instead of seeing him as the one that's a slave or a taskmaster, which he never was, but if you're not right spiritually, you can see it that way. Instead of seeing that, then you'll see him as the one that loves you above all else. What was the testament of Christ that he loved himself and gave himself for the church? Or loved the church and gave himself for it. That's what I meant to say. That's the instruction that husbands are given. To love their wives as Christ loved the church. So if that was God's instruction, don't you think God knows how to take care of his bride? Then, verse number 17, For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and there shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day when I make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of the heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. What's that? That's the millennial reign that we were talking about. Verse number 19, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear from the heavens and they shall hear the earth and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel and I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy and I will say to them which were not my people thou art my people and they shall say thou art my God what's that? well we already hinted at it in the millennial reign spiritually what's that talking about? saying that those that endure the punishment that they brought upon themselves. There are some people that do God wrong and they never get over it. They stay broken. There are some that are so humiliated they won't come back to the Father's house. And you know why? It's because they don't either know or they've forgotten how merciful and how loving God is. Well, didn't Jesus say that the world would know we were his disciples? Yep. We have love one for another. There's no contingency on that. That's right. We're not supposed to love one another as long as we all show up at the same place on Sunday morning. That's right. right? We're supposed to restore those sure. that have fallen in a spirit of meekness yeah. lest we're tempted in the same way. That's right. Those that have forgotten the mercies of God, who's supposed to go and get them? Yeah. Well, the Lord calls to them. But every now and then, they forget. They just need to feel the love of God again. Are we not vessels to be poured out? Are we not to be filled with God so that God can dump us out into the world? Sure. Sure. But there are those out there that need to hear. Yeah, you've walked, but if you get back to the Father's house, there's a whole lot of good that He'll do for you. No doubt. You'll even forget yeah. that you once were in this place. He'll elevate you above and away from it. He'll remove it from you. Those that were not, he said, would be. But the thought out of all of this comes all the way back in verse number 5. For her mother hath played the harlot. She hath conceived them, hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers and give my bread and my water and wool and my flax and oil and my drink. What was the indictment against the church of Laodicea? Yeah. They thought that they were increased with goods that had need of nothing. Yeah, that's right. What did God say that they would, they being Israel, would call him Ishi, husband, provider? Okay? So we're going to teach this morning on when you think God doesn't have what you need. Why did the woman leave her husband in the illustration? Because she thought, my lovers can give me the thing that I used to desire from my husband. They can provide for me better than the one that I promised to be faithful to. 
Right? They can do better for me than the one that said he would give me his all. And really, I just have to give them some of my time. These were not new husbands. They were affairs. They didn't last long, but she thought that they'd last long enough that she'd get what she needed. And what did that do? Well, what are those lovers? He wasn't talking about Israel going out and getting hitched to a different country. Right? The metaphor is, is that they sought after different gods. They sought after wisdom that wasn't of God. They sought after the philosophies of man. They sought after those things which made sense to them carnally, but spiritually didn't make sense to God. That they had to make themselves dumb in the spirit in order to do it in the flesh. Because you'll never be able to embrace the world. You'll never be able to embrace spiritually different lovers unless you've forgotten about God. Because it just doesn't make sense. You've got to forget everything that the Spirit's done in your heart. You've got to put it aside in order to embrace something different. Because a man cannot serve two masters. Right. He'll love one and hate the other. Yeah. Sure. Why did she go after different? Because she thought that God didn't have what she needed. Man. Or she thought that she could get what God gave her somewhere else. Hmm. You know why people look for someone other than God to provide for them? They don't like the responsibility. We heard about it on Wednesday night. I'm not blessed because I do for God. I'm blessed because God loves me. Amen. I'm blessed because He chooses to show mercy and grace to somebody that doesn't deserve it. Sure. But I have been bought with a price. No doubt. He can't help but love me. He's God. He is love. Right. But because of the love of God, I feel obliged. Or I feel guilty if I don't do something for God. Not because he asked me to do it, but because I just, as good as he's been to me, I deserve to do something for him. Sure. He deserves to have me praise his name. He deserves to be glorified among men. Why do you think the rocks will take our place if we don't cry out and praise him? Because he's so deserving that even rocks will cry out because they know that God deserves praise if I don't praise him. But see, if I don't think that God's the only place that I can get those blessings, that joy, the grace, all those fruits of the Spirit that He does in my heart. Sure. If I don't see God as the only place that I can go and get a drink, I'll start looking somewhere else because I'm not obligated to somebody that's just an affair. That's a thing of convenience, not of commitment. That's right. And when people think, well, I can just... Instead of going to church on Wednesday night, having to get up, smell good, look good, and instead of having to put it on a smile and you know try and hoodwink everybody into the fact that I'm not miserable right now, instead of doing that, I can just stay home, read a devotion, and then get to put on my favorite TV show, and I can laugh for a little bit. You say that doesn't happen. Now, how come church houses all over the world are empty? Right. Why have people forsaken them? Why is God stamped Ichabod above so many places? Because they said, I can get what God wants to give me somewhere else. And they found out afterwards that the way that they take is a hard one because God will hedge them in with thorns. He'll build walls up around them so that they can't pursue what they want to. And they don't understand why they're oil, why they're flax, why they're, you know everything that they have, their gold, their silver, everything that they thought was precious, it's disappearing and they don't know why. They don't understand why they're miserable when they wake up every day. It's because they've left the one that gave them all those things. And they're trying to find it somewhere else. But when you don't think that God has what you need or when you think that somebody else can give you what only God can give you, you will leave the camp. You know what happened back in the day to those that did commit adultery if they were caught in the act, they'd stone them. Why do you think that God went through the illustration here in verse number 7, and she shall follow after her lover. She goes, goes through everything that she's going to do. Then it says, verse number 19, Therefore will I return, verse number 9, not 19, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof. In other words, the corn ain't going to 
produce any new corn. There will be a stalk, but there's no corn on the cob, so to speak. You can shuck it all you want to, but there's not going to be anything on the inside you can eat. He says, and my wine in the season there. In other words, olives, grapes, ain't going to grow on the vine. And will recover my wool and my flax, given to cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. Why? Because the husband had the duty, but also the responsibility before God to take charge of his home. Sure, sure. If he didn't punish a wife that wasn't faithful, he would either be written off out of society, or he'd have been kicked out of the town for allowing it to continue ostracized nobody would have done business with him because that's a man that doesn't fear God yeah. that's how it used to be and God's saying none shall take her out of my hand because it's my responsibility to she promised to be faithful and she broke her vow and she has to pay the price but see when you think that somebody else has what only God can do for you you will she knew all that Israel knew that God was a jealous God. Sure. That's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. That our God is a consuming fire. That knew all that, had heard it, but still chose to do it. You'll be willing to face whatever consequences just for a little bit of pleasure now. Is that not what she did? Why did she get all decked out to go to the finest feast? in the name of Balaam the new moons the harvest right? the Sabbath feast everything that they did under the guise of doing it for God they went out and they got themselves slapped silly enjoying themselves in the flesh woke up the next day feeling miserable probably lost a little bit of all that jewelry that she was decked out in and then would come stumbling home hoping that she didn't get caught but the husband knew all along you will throw your life away chasing the high instead of just enjoying what God gives you now am I talking about lewdness not necessarily could be lasciviousness takes all forms of sin but when you desire something more than God you'd sell your very soul if you could if it wasn't sealed by the Holy Spirit because where your heart is there your treasure will be also but see when you start down that road if you're not repenting of it you'll have to pay the price for it what he said he said I'm going to take back everything that I gave her as a provider as one that loved her as one that cared for her one that wanted to see her taken care of before I took care of myself he said everybody else was using her and just giving her compensation on the side he said I gave her my best and I'll take it back before I make an example out of her you know why unfortunately Israel's still fighting wars over land today because they rejected God That's right. and a lot of them haven't repented of it sure. they'll always be God's people and one day they'll be called the sons of God in the place where God said I'm going to scatter you yeah. but you know why there wasn't a nation of Israel for so long until 1946 you know why that was because God scattered them sure. made an example out of and he wouldn't be their God for they were children conceived in whoredom chasing after false gods Amen. some of them today still claim to keep the paths that were given to Moses but they don't realize that one came that fulfilled the law to deliver them from the law why do they chase after it because they have delight in thinking that doing this will bring me favor with God they think well if I can just do all these listed rules I can live however I want to the rest of the week a lot of them take it very serious some of them have two kitchens in their house one that they keep like sealed off and bubbled and they only use it during the Passover feast because they don't want it to get tainted and contaminated with everything else that they cook throughout the year 
They've got different wardrobes that they wear, depending on which day of the week it is. There's one guy, a political commentator, his name's Ben Shapiro, he's an Orthodox Jew. He's got two different razors. He's got an electric one that will use Sunday through Friday, but on the Sabbath day, he'll use a manual razor, an old razor blade. Because they believe that you can't do anything that makes labor or work on the Sabbath. Right? So they have to do it. Can't take any shortcuts. Right? You say, well, that's a bunch of hogwash. Yeah. But they believe that that brings them closer to God. Because works and keeping the law would merit the favor. There's a lot of people out there laboring for things that they hope will bring them either delight, pleasure, favor with God. A lot of it's out of ignorance shame on us that so many have given up, have returned to the whoredoms of their sinfulness and as a result the world doesn't understand there's a better way they haven't seen it how did a land that once was known as a land where people came for religious freedom not all those religions were right but they did desire to get to a place where they could worship God as God said you know where a lot of Baptists ended up at? Rhode Island, smallest place. You want to know what God did with them? You can go a lot of places find a whole bunch of Baptists. But Rhode Island was the only state that didn't have laws against Baptists, or the only colony back in the day when they were first founded. You know what God did? Bless them. They was the smallest, but they was always provided for. Yeah. Pennsylvania, a whole bunch of Quakers. Right? They believe that, no, we won't do, we're going to do things a certain way because we think that God will honor it. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. They thought that works would give them what they needed, not God. Why do you think Amish people still do things the way that they do them today? Because they think that their life is holier. It just draws them closer to God. Now, hey, they can build a lot of nice stuff, and they do it really well. Great craftsmanship. But God's not looking for craftsmanship. He's looking for Christ. Amen. But how is the world going to think that what we've got is real when so many just abandon, leave? They're saying, that we might as well go over here, Jezreel, right? The one that was slain, wrongfully, murdered. Sure. God says that he would visit upon the house of Jehu the punishment for that. You know who Jezreel was? God's appointed man. You know what the house of Jehu did? Try to remove God's man. Sure. When you rebel, when you buck against what God wants to do, you always have to pay the price. No doubt. No doubt. But when you think that, well, we don't need the one that God wants, we can do it our way. Sure. I don't need to do it the way that God said. I can do it my way. I don't need revival. I just need other people to, you know, Stop being so sinful and then things will pick up. Or, you know what? Services we've had around here. I might start one of you know, looking for a different church. Right? You say that doesn't happen. There been grumblings. They know better than to come and talk to me. Amen. But they know better than people I don't know who, Brother Josh, but somebody. Dad's out there down there preaching for y'all. Word gets back to the pastor. People weren't happy with who the pastor let preach. I was. But Phil, he started using words I didn't know Phil knew. <laughs> but he did a wonderful job. But Josh, wonderful job. Yeah. And I don't know how it went, but I had time up here teaching, preaching. But what is that? That's rebelling against God's order, God's authority. That's saying, I know better than God's man. Well, if you did, you would be God's man. You know why the house of Jehu had to pay the price? Because they said, we know better than God, and we have to get rid of the one that God put into power before we can do what we want to do. Why do you think so many churches want pastors they can control? Why do you think so many deacons run so many houses of God? Because people don't want a leader. They want a puppet. They want a hireling. They want someone with sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. 
But when you don't think that God has what you need, you'll put Satan himself in the power. How do you think the Antichrist is going to take over? They'll let the son of perdition come in, run his way in the house of God as long as they get to go home and do whatever they want to do. When you don't think that God has what you need, you stop caring about others and you only care about yourself. He said, you'll call me Ishi one day, the one that does provide for you. But we got off track. Outline's out the window. We're almost out of time. I will say this. Church of Laodicea forgot that they had everything that they had because God gave it to them. We are a very needy people. You know what Israel thought? Well, God's blessed us so good, we can go out and start being something different than what God intended us to be. Sure. I'm not needy anymore. I can provide on my own. Or I found something else that can provide for me. I can't take a breath unless God ordains it. Amen. Yet some people want to take so much control of their lives and give back God so little. Right. You know what will happen? You'll start hanging things around necklaces that in the eyes of God are whoredoms. Because they're precious to you. You don't want to let them get away from you. You'll take off godliness. You'll take off decency. You'll take off holiness. And you'll put it in a treasure box until the next Sunday rolls around. But you'll let idolatry. You'll let whoredoms. You'll let sure. worship in something else. You'll never take that off. Right. I do have a necklace that I wear. Don't take it off. goes in the shower with me. goes everywhere. You know why? Because it's precious. It's something that my grandfather gave me. Something that he used to wear for years as a police officer. Right? Something that means something to me. I'm gonna go home and take this suit off later. Doesn't mean too much to me. Right? I'll take this watch off later. I like it, but I got other ones, and I don't sleep with a watch on. But those things that are precious to me, they're never far away. so many people have taken God off of the pedestal of their heart sure. and they think that he's something they can just put on and take off huh. they think that they're you know that flax that wool the clothing the stitching the things that are meant to keep them warm well sometimes I get a little hot but it's always decent it's always in order to be ordained or uh, arraigned before God in the clothing that he gave you you don't think Jesus got hot walking around in a tunic? Yeah. Right? They didn't even wear socks. They wore sandals because it got so hot. That's right. right. But it's always right to do right. Amen. Why do you think that so many people, as soon as they saw Jesus, they went up to him and said, Rabbi or Master? Because yeah. he looked like he knew God. Because he was God. Was there was something different about him. Good. Why do you think... The Apostle Paul wrote to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's easier to put off holiness. Yeah, it's easier to put off righteousness. Sure. Because there is strife, there's struggle in contending for the faith. It's easier, but the world will always try to barter away godliness and they'll try to pay you as little as it takes. They'd let you give it to them for free. They're not looking for a trade. They're just trying to remove what it is that God's put into your life so that they don't have to look at it. So that they don't have to confront it. Because you're written epistles. And when people read your lives and it doesn't jive with what they've been living, yeah. it bothers them. That's right. And they want to remove that from their life. So they'll sell you any lie that they can. They'll give you all the food, water, oil that you want. But there's two things they can't give you. Peace and joy. Amen. And your way will be hedged with thorns. There will be walls all around you so that you can't take the way that you desire to take. And when you're wondering, well, how come I can't do what I want to do? Well, maybe it's because it ain't what God wants you to do. Yeah. Maybe it's because you go and you try to put on holiness, but deep down in your heart, you need to go back to the wilderness where God originally found you out in the muck and the mire 
And you need to realize that God didn't tell you to go to the city in order to get everything. That, he didn't tell you to go get refined. He didn't tell you to go get all pampered and decked out in gold and silver. In the wilderness, that's where he gave you, Hosea. God told Hosea. In the wilderness, he gave you a vineyard. In the wilderness, he gave you all the desires of your heart. Out when, you know, in the wilderness, when there's no water, he made water come out of rocks. He caused manna to fall from heaven. Like John the Baptist, you may have lived on locusts and honey for a while, and you may have been clothed with camel hair, but you never went for naught. And you always had the presence of God. And we forget that, and we go to this. What was Lot's indictment? That he saw Sodom and Gomorrah and pitched his tent towards it. It made sense to the flesh. The Bible says that those cities looked like the Garden of God. The very Garden of Eden. And so Lot said, yeah, that would work out good. Until he realized that he liked the cities more than he liked God. God still called Lot a righteous man. He didn't do wrong, but because of his proximity, he took off some of that righteousness. Some of that They made him a judge because they said, this guy knows the difference between right and wrong. They gave him a position, but he gave in to the pressures. You could still be good in the eyes of man in the eyes of the world you can still know the difference between right and wrong sure. but there's a difference between doing the right thing and doing it the right way yes. it's either God's way or no way Amen. and when we forsake the you know what the wilderness is a place where you can't figure out how it's going to happen you don't know how God's going to make it all come together yes. but see as the provider he doesn't have to show us anything we just have to be faithful you know what the mother's job was? To train up the next generation. To raise them in the knowledge of God so that when the father came home, his children didn't act like heathens, they act like children of the father. It was her job to prepare the meal, to prepare the food, but where'd the food come from? The father. Well, yeah, there was a vineyard that the father provided, but who kept it? Those that were at home. Most often the children. And why do you think that the indictment was nobody's kept the hedge? That there's gaps in the hedge. Make up the hedge. Tend to it. Fix the walls that were broken down. Why were they broken down? Because nobody was taking care of the Father's vineyard. That's right. When you think that God doesn't have what you need, you'll let all of this go to naught. Oh you won't care if you walk in and there's a little bit of garbage in the floor. You won't care if you drive by and somebody forgot to mow the grass that week. Oh because everything that God gives you has no value because your heart's in a far country. You're just coming back to the house to get a little bit of sleep and then go back out for riotous living. Oh. And you don't care what God gives you. You don't tend it. You don't keep it. Because you think that the world can give you what only God did. That's right. And you leave the wilderness. You forget your faith. You leave your faithfulness. And then all you do is come in and out like saloon doors. Yeah. Blow in, blow out. Just in long enough to get whatever it was that you want. Sure. Why? Because you think that God doesn't have what you really need. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.